Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Carmen Pang, and I am the co-founder and co-director of SWAG, the Singapore Wildcat Action Group. Welcome to our first Wildcat lecture of this year, 2022. And I am so happy to see so many of you joining us to learn more about the clouded lab pit. And I noticed that um, in the chat, you know, that it's more than just those of us in Singapore. You know, I, we're welcoming uh, you from all over the world. So this is really exciting. And as a special treat today, because we have two speakers who will be joining us. Um, normally, if you're familiar with our lectures, you know, we usually have one speaker, but today we have two, so it's very exciting. Um, we will introduce them to you in just a moment, but before we proceed, uh, I'll need to take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, we'll be recording uh, today's lecture and a recording will be available on the SWAG YouTube channel uh, later on. And in the channel, you will actually also find recordings of our previous lectures. So please do check it out and um, catch up with uh, lectures that you've missed before. And secondly, to minimize distraction and to conserve bandwidth, uh, we'd like to ask you to mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentations and use the chat function to ask any questions you have for our speakers. We'll be monitoring the chat and then um, we're gonna keep all the questions and ask them when both speakers have uh, finished presenting at the, um, the Q and A session will be at the very end. Okay, now that we've gotten that taken care of, let's get today's program started. As many of you already know, since um, our founding in 2019, SWAG has been organizing regular Wildcat lectures, such as this one today, as part of our mission to bring awareness of Wildcats to the public. But in addition to raising awareness and doing educational outreach, SWAG also works very hard to uh, raise funds to support MyCat, which stands for the Malaysian Conservation Alliance for Tigers. And here to tell us a little bit more about SWAG and about MyCat, and to introduce today's speakers is my co-host and SWAG co-founder, co Dr. Vilma Di Rosario. Vilma, over to you. Thanks, Carmen. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, yeah, just uh, like Carmen says, uh, I'll, I'll say something about SWAG uh, and uh, about our partner, partner MyCat. Um, okay. Always can't, it, it always doesn't move when I, I try to do it for the real thing. Ah. Oh, I think it's frozen. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop share. Please, sorry about this. And then I'll share it again. Share screen. This one and share. Okay. Okay. Ah, all right. <laughs> so we're from the Singapore Wildcat Action Group. And uh, our mission statement is taking action for wildcat conservation. Um, we'd like to share with you some of the things that we do um, as SWAG. And uh, today uh, you're here with us for a wildcat lecture. Uh, and these raise awareness on wildcat conservation through um, you know, people, uh, experts, uh, sharing about what they, they love and what they know best. And today it's on clouded leopards. Um, we also have an annual conference on tigers, Singapore Tiger Week. Um, we started off with face-to-face -face lectures, but since 2020, we've had online web webinars. And so far the online ones are, were on leopard cats, cheetahs, tiger cats, fishing cats. And um, we've had three um, Singapore Tiger Week conferences. We hope to have uh, one this year. So we hope that in the latter part of this year, <clears throat> you'll be joining us for that. We also um, take action for wildcats. For example, painting a community mural to raise awareness about leopard cats, as you can see in the photograph. 
So for those of you who don't know, we have together with our partner, Mural Lingo, uh, a huge uh, 20 meter across mural uh, in the un uh, along the underpass of uh, Elgin Bridge, uh, showcasing leopard cats and other wild neighbors that live uh, in our urban city. We also uh, do catwalks, do meaning we help organize catwalks, which are uh, actually organized by, by my cat. Uh, cat walk stands for Citizen Action for Tigers. It's an anti-poaching, anti-deforestation surveillance walk. And since 2015, about 300 people from Singapore have been to uh, Marapo or the Sungai Yu uh, Ecological Corridor in Pahang to walk the forest edge, uh, look for snares and traps and other illegal activities and report those to the authorities and to plant trees. We've taken a break from uh, catwalk for about two years, but we are hoping to resume uh, third quarter of this year, sometime maybe August or September. So stay tuned. Uh, we would love all of you to come with us. We also educate youth about wildcats and nurture a love for wildlife by storytelling. And we have a roving school exhibition on leopard cats. Uh, it's roving to one school right now. That's the third school. And if you're from a school, please get in touch with us because we'd love the poster exhibition to go to your school. <clears throat> We also fight illegal wildlife trade by raising awareness about uh, the trade and advocating for tougher laws and improve enforcement. One of our big actions is fundraising. We're not very good at that. So if you, you are very good at fundraising, we really appreciate your help. Um, we raise funds for MyCat through fundraisers and the sale of swag merchandise. And in the photo, you see uh, us at a beer stall in a hawker center, Smith Street Taps. And what they did was they made uh, t-shirts and they sold these t-shirts and all proceeds were given to us. Uh, so that's lovely. And we've also partnered with a corporate called Kloop and they upcycle clothes and you know, proceeds from uh, the sale of their upcycle um, clothes came to us. So uh, please do consider if you're from a corporate, you know, how you may partner with us and help uh, tigers in the process. By our swag, we have four children's books. Um, uh, please go to our store. We will let you have the uh, website uh, link. Uh, by our, our, our books, we have cushion covers as well. And yeah, here it is. This is the... Uh, address, go to our store and, and help us uh, fundraise by buying our merchandise. All proceeds from sale of our merchandise uh, and fundraising go to MyCat Community Rangers. Um, the photo here is of, of two of uh, their community rangers patrolling the forest to look for poaching signs and other activities that compromise the survival of the Malayan tiger and they report this to the authorities. They also grow native trees and uh, plant them to restore forest habitats. So we believe very strongly that this is a great cause. So our fundraising goes towards um, their uh, support. And uh, this is a special fundraiser, specially launching right now, as we speak, the Clouded Leopard Bag. It's a limited edition. It's uh, designed and drawn and made, uh, created by our very own uh, swag volunteer, Rachel. Uh, for any donation of $100 and more, if you visit our swag store after this talk, you can buy one. And we only have 20, all right? Um, so please do you know, uh, consider this and all funds will be going to the Community Rangers project. We also have the Leopard Cat Quest at Pulau Ubin. We've already had one. And from that, we raised over $1,000 for the Community Rangers. We're having another uh, on June 17th. 
please sign up for it. Again, you can find that on our store, um, probably this weekend or next week. All proceeds again to MyCat Community Rangers. And uh, we'd like to announce, this is coming up in July. We're partnering with um, uh, Laya Liar, uh, Lara Arifin and her team to bring in uh, Nat Geo's Malaysia's Last Tigers film. And this is going to be a fundraiser at the projector. And again, all funds will go to MyCat. This time, sorry, part of the funds are going to Rima and part of the funds are going to MyCat to fight poaching. Again, you can find all these things, you can buy all these things from our store. And last but not least, uh, all our work would not be possible without our volunteers. We have a wonderful team of volunteers, but we still need more. Uh, so if you think that you're very enthusiastic or good at fundraising or just love fundraising, we need you. Social media content creators, storytellers, people who love to do uh, kids' activities, uh, people who can do digital marketing, artists, video makers, photographers, and drivers, because we have this exhibition and we need the exhibition driven to various uh, locations. Uh, and at this point, both Carmen and I would like to thank uh, especially two volunteers, Daphne for uh, creating the bag, sorry, Rachel for creating the bag, and Daphne for organizing this talk. Thanks very much, everyone. And now we can start uh, with uh, the uh, proper uh, on clouded leopards. Um, could I invite, uh, I'll stop share. And could I invite um, Christian to just have your first slide and I'll introduce you after you have your first slide there. So whilst Christian's bringing it up, we have Christian Gomez and Cedric Tan, and I'll introduce them one at a time. Okay, so Christian Gomez um, is our sp first speaker. Christian is from Malaysia, he's a KL boy, and he's currently doing his doctoral studies at the University of Oxford, Department of Zoology. Uh, studying the genetic methods to investigate population histories of the Sunda clouded leopard in Borneo. But before this, he was studying as well as he was managing the Bornean carnivore program in Borneo, uh, studying carnivores. And uh, he has uh, a, a dream of inspiring youth to champion environmental issues and to take positive action for Earth. And today he's going to tell us all about his work uh, and his talk is, is called A Genomic Path to Felid Conservation in Malaysia. Christian, please. All right, good evening or good morning from wherever you are in the world. For me, it's a morning. For most of you, it should be an evening. Uh, I'll just start by saying that it is really quite remarkable that 40 odd people from Southeast Asia primarily is getting together on a Saturday to listen to a talk about this random cat in the forest. And I say random cat, not because I don't love it or not because I'm dispassionate about it, but because in Asia, the phenomenon is problems around wildlife and the environment is too large, too far in the future, um, such that it is often pushed back like to the very, very um uh, lowest priorities on all of our on all of our thoughts and i think i think we we're, we're lagging behind severely especially since i've come to the uk and in, interacted more with people from the west i can see that there's a massive um gap in prioritization so i think it's really encouraging for me at least to see that well maybe in singapore there is this fledglings of interest in um issues around wildlife and the environment. Uh, and you need not be a wildlife enthusiast or a scientist or a person whose career depends on it in order for you to have an interest in it. So this is really quite remarkable. And I just want to start by that. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Christian. I'm 27 years old. I'm from Malaysia, from KL, as Vilma mentioned. I currently do a PhD at Oxford. Now, 
I have been studying clouded leopards now for about four years. Uh, it's remarkable because it's gone by really quickly. The first three years of my research was based in Borneo. So I was based in this forest up north Borneo in a state called Sabah. Um, I had not done any research before. I hardly knew anything about the cloud leopard before. So it was really quite a leap of faith because I knew I wanted to do work in conservation. And research was one of the few ways you could do work in conservation. So I took a job. Uh, at that time, the lab that I work for now was looking for a local Malaysian field manager to run its operations in the forest. And the job ticked all my boxes. It was an exciting adventure for me at the time. I was 24 years old. I was like, yeah, okay, sure. No commitments. I'm going to move to the forest, live there, and we'll see how it goes. I really had no expectations, but that one decision has since uh, completely transformed my life because now my days and nights are spent thinking about this animal that I knew almost nothing about when I was a teenager. Um, so yeah, there's hope for all of us yet. That is my mantra. No matter how dissociated you might be from wildlife, if you find a, a passion in it or a reason to be passionate about it, um, there's nothing stopping you really. So this is the group. Uh, on the top is the director of Wild Crew, uh, David, the man with the beard. And uh, the man to his left is my current supervisor, Andrew. He's the one that hired me when I first moved to Sabah. And he also started the cloud leopard research in Sabah about 15 years ago. Uh, the whole of Wild Crew is below. It's, an, it's a rather large wildlife research unit. Uh, our second speaker, Cedric, also worked with Wild Crew for quite a long time. Um, it's pretty cool because there's researchers from almost every corner of the globe and everyone's doing research in different systems, all of the most threatened systems in the world. So on day to day, I get to interact with people studying on lions and wolves and hyenas and wild dogs um, and even things like mice and grasshoppers. So it's been quite a, uh, quite a remarkable experience so far. But today I'm here to talk to you about this animal. So you'll notice that I'm putting the word Sunda before clouded leopard. And that's because I study a specific type of clouded leopard. Now, about 10 years ago, I think there were, pap there were three papers published that confirmed that there are in fact two species of clouded leopards. Before that, we only thought there was one and they were all the same. But there's enough evidence now to say that the clouded leopards on the island of Borneo and Sumatra is a complete different species. Hence the name now being Sunda clouded leopard. Um, so before, before I think the year 2014 or 2015, there was almost no study, no systematic study on Sunda clouded leopards. Meaning that had I come to this talk in 2012 and any of you had asked me, well, Christian, since you study clouded leopards, how many of them are there? I would have to say, I don't know. Uh, if you ask another simple question like, well, Christian, since you study cloud leopards, um, what's the ratio of male to females? Or what is male behavior like? Or where do they spend their, their time? Up on trees or on the ground? I would have to say, I don't know. So it's quite startling, right? Because we'd imagine in an age of technology and when there's so much information, simple questions like that should be right off the shelves. We should know these things, right? So it's quite surprising to me when I started doing research, how little we knew and how much opportunity there was for us to uncover these things. Because the moment you go slightly to the West in Central Asia or Africa, there we know everything about every animal, right? It's been studied for decades and decades and decades and we have all kinds of data. In fact, like I think the data is now being stretched too far and they're answering questions that perhaps they shouldn't be answering from the data they have. And so there's, I, I think from a conservation context and with research at large, everyone's eyes are now shifting towards Southeast Asia because there's this huge vacuum of knowledge that we need, right? And this, this is a priority for conservationists today. In Borneo, uh, just to highlight some of the threats and some of the reasons why it's becoming quite concerning, you can see very, very visually from this graph that since the 50s, about 50%, no, maybe slightly more, about 50 to 60% of Borneo has lost its forest, right? And that is a massive rate of decline. And that rate has not really slowed down. So we're still losing forest every single year. Uh, what are we losing it to? Um, it differs depending on which government you speak to, but everyone says that it was the British who cut everything down. 
uh, that's not entirely true. Um, he's just an easy person to blame. Um, the, the truth is, all of these countries in Borneo, with the exception of Brunei, heavily relies on timber as a source of economic revenue, uh, heavily relies on palm oil as revenue as well. So a lot of these forests are being converted to palm oil or just being deforested simply because um, they want timber. It's very lucrative, right? Um, and so you would imagine that from such forest shrinkage, of course, the main problem for an animal like the clouded leopard is going to be no habitat. Well, interestingly enough, our research kind of highlighted that that is not necessarily the case. The problem really is that all of these forest patches, while still there in quite high, high numbers, um, still large amounts of forest compared to everywhere else in the world, but it's all fragmented. And the reason for this is because palm oil growers and people who cut trees don't like cutting trees on mountain. They cut flat ground, right? For, for obvious reasons, it's easy. And so all of these timber companies have taken all of the flat, beautiful land out. And so what you get is this islanding effect where you have all these mountains that are forests. So think about the range where Mount Kinabalu is on. Beautiful forests, right? The only reason why it's still forest is because it's too difficult to cut trees there. It's just too expensive. And so you have these islands where of mountains where forests are intact, and then the surrounding flatland, boom, all gone, right? So what happens to an animal like the cloud leopard? You have this fragmentation where they exist in these mountain, mountain regions, and then it's separated by another to another forest by a massive area of flatland that is either now palm oil or has industrialized into factories and housing estates, right? Um, so this is the major problem because we are finding that all cloud leopards are now fragmented. They are isolated in pockets. They're not moving. They're not connecting. And we had to prove this, of course. And in order to prove this, there's only a few methods you can use. And I'm going to talk about this towards the end of my talk. Uh, but just to expand on this idea of fragmentation and why it's really, really so harmful. So this is just a visual sort of extreme example of what fragmentation is like. Um, now, I'm a geneticist, so I think about fragmentation as a geneticist. Say, for example, you have a population of butterflies in a forest, in three forest patches. And these three forest patches are now separated by all kinds of development. One might be a road, another might be an agricultural plantation. You have this butterfly population that is from this middle block, right? And you see these purple and yellow butterflies, right? But because of the fragmentation, you have now split up the populations into three. Now, because you split up the population and they cannot communicate between each other, you have different effects. Perhaps in one forest, one type of butterfly, which was green, moved to that forest and was the only green butterfly that went there. And none of these purple and yellow ones went there. What you get there is this effect of speciation, where you have a variant of a butterfly that goes to another habitat, doesn't mingle anymore, and you've now cut the gene pool in half because you have all the yellow and purples on one side and all the greens on another side. This is not good in the context of genetic diversity because it leads to something called inbreeding where all of the individuals with the same genetic type just keeps mating among themselves. The same can be said if you have just one butterfly of the purple and yellow cut off from the forest. You'll see that the forest on the left and the forest on the extreme right will never mix together and you'll have this massive separation of genetic types. This is the major problem with fragmentation because you have genes separated and you get a shrinkage of the entire gene pool. Inbreeding in humans is also happening, right? It happens, but at a much smaller degree. With animals, it's a lot more pronounced. You can think about inbreeding most commonly among the royal families um, because obviously the monarchs tend to uh, breed with, well, breed is a bad word, but tend to mate with other <laughs> monarchs and they tend to be from the same families. Um, the European monarchy is a great example of it. I just came back from Italy and I realized that they've been marrying among German and Scandinavian and English royal families for centuries. And this is horrible. So they were finding there was a high amount of genetic diseases among the royal family, which kind of pushed them to start marrying Princess Diana and Kate Middleton and all the normal people. Right? It was this effort to try and expand the gene pool. So the exact same phenomenon happens to animals but to a much, much more severe degree. We're seeing 
diseases wipe out entire species really quickly in a single generation. Uh, this is happening for tigers in Peninsular Malaysia. You'll hear on the news quite often now that uh, this particular pesky virus called canine distemper virus being found over and over again, right? And it's proving to be quite a lethal thing because every individual they find with canine distemper virus dies. And this is terrible because it's a virus. In the age of pandemic, we now know how easily and how problematic viruses can be. So this is exactly why we need genetic diversity. One of those individuals, one of those tigers may hold the variant necessary to fend off the virus. But because the gene pool is so small, the chances of you finding these mutations that can fend off just by chance, fend off these viruses is now infinitely smaller, right? So I hope I've explained this concept of fragmentation well and why this is a massive, massive problem for most of the predators in all, all over Southeast Asia, really. But in Borneo, this is quite pronounced. Um, but I would say in Borneo, we're actually catching it a bit early because cloud leopard numbers, and this is probably why the numbers are actually quite healthy. They're nowhere near as dire as the situation in Peninsula for tigers. And the reason for this is manifold. Um, one being cloud leopards are way harder to see. So they're not as hunted as tigers are. So that's a big plus on the cloud leopard side. Um, also in Borneo, there isn't a huge culture of poaching for the sale, right? So poaching happens mainly for consumption by indigenous communities. There's not a lot of evidence. You might say that there's just weak research, but there's not a lot of evidence of poaching being done for trade. So by this, I mean a cloud leopard being shot specifically because someone wants to sell a cloud leopard across the border. There's not a lot of evidence that this happens. The last convicted person that did this, and he, the guy got convicted. So the last case of this was in 2015. So in seven years, there's been no evidence of this happening. Um, and I think we would know because we're quite close to the wildlife department and they tend to tell us about all these cases. So that's pretty good. That's, that's tilted the favor, that's tilted things in favor of the cloud leopard in Borneo. Um, but of course, so if you wanted me to give you a number in Sabah, which is the smallest territory in Borneo, there's about 700 to 1,000 individuals, right? And Sabah is relatively small. It's probably constituting only 30% of Borneo. So if you extrapolated the figures, you tend to get a rough estimate of, you know, something like four or 5,000 individuals. But we can't make approximations like that because habitat composition in every one of these places are different. And that's why research needs to expand aggressively to get better estimates before I start saying anything scientific. Um, so why we study cloud leopards? Um, there's a lot of animals in Borneo, as all of you know, and all of them are understudied, to be honest. But the reason why we started, started with cloud leopard is because there are no tigers on Borneo. There are no regular common leopards. It's just the cloud leopard at the top of the food chain. This is the head honcho, right? The big guy, the apex predator. And apex predators have been known to be a really good proxy for the health of an ecosystem, right? When apex predators collapse, they tend to have a really devastating effect to ecosystems. You'll find, ironically enough, the, the biggest change that happens when apex predators die is plant composition drops drastically. But it's quite intuitive. Apex predators die, herbivores increase, plants die, right? And this has been seen over and over again. It's been tested over and over and again. And such when they've introduced apex predators in places that didn't have apex predators, plant life flourishes. And the habitat on Borneo is so precarious and so dependent on this massive diversity of plant life, it alludes all the more to the massive importance of cloud leopards in the area to keep populations of everything in balance, right? So this is why we're so fascinated and interested in making sure we know how cloud leopards in Borneo are doing, right? Cloud leopards live like most other cats, like also the leopard cat, they are solitary. Males leave their mums by age of two. Um, and their, their survival depends on the ability to disperse. Um, there's not huge evidence of territoriality. Um, there's some overlap, but they are quite strict about their home ranges, and their home ranges are large. Um, just to give you context, uh, the cloud leopard we were, stud we were most recently studying had a home range of about 200 square kilometers. Now, that's massive. That's almost the home range of a tiger, right? Um, slightly smaller, but it's massive for an animal this size. Uh, and that's because they're an apex predator. 
So you'd imagine that a young male would need to disperse to find a forest patch in which he can establish a range about that size. Um, so dispersal is super, super key. And that is the biggest problem today because animals can't disperse when the habitats are fragmented. Um, now we are finding that they are quite specialist in habitat type. So unlike the leopard cat, which loves palm oil plantations, you'll find them in domestic houses. People keep them as pets all, of, all the time. Uh, cloud leopards, on the other hand, are extremely specialist. They stick within the bounds of a forest almost all the time. And they're quite conservative about decisions to venture into open spaces, right? And this alludes to the cryptic nature of the animal. Um, so this is why it succeeded so long, but it's also why the situation is quite sensitive, right? There's going to be a tipping point in which there's not going to be enough forest and the population is just going to collapse really drastically. We're not there yet, uh, which is why this is a massive, massive opportunity to put in place legislation um, for an animal while it is still doing okay and to make sure that it remains to be okay for a long time uh, before it becomes unsageable. Like I think seeing the type of situation in Peninsula is... Um, this is how we study cloud leopards now. And this is the project I'm involved in at the moment. The video you're seeing on the left is me, uh, Andrew, and our vet, Palomo. This is a collared cloud leopard. Uh, his name was Gilmore. We featured on a Netflix documentary as well. So it's quite cool. Oh, we have part of this animal. Um, so what we're doing is putting a collar on. I'm sure most of you are familiar with GPS collars. They are sort of the go-to uh, method today try and understand how cloud leopards use the landscape. So you can think about when we're trying to study something like, you know, when an animal disperses, how well can it disperse, how far can it disperse, what habitat does it need to disperse? Colors are a great way to answer that question. And the figure you see on the right, uh, that red and blue line, is actual coloring data from cloud leopards. In fact, this was the first coloring data for cloud leopards in a primary forest. So that green patch you're seeing is in Tawa of East Sabah, and it's a primary forest. Uh, so these cloud leopards are behaving like how a cloud leopard would behave when they, when they live in pristine habitat. And it doesn't take a scientist to tell you that they're staying within the forest. They're not going out. That one event you're seeing where that blue star is at, that was a kill event when there was a pig in that oil palm estate and this individual actually ventured out on multiple occasions to eat that pig. Uh, but that was it. Otherwise, they stayed very happily within the bounds of their forest. Now, the forest patch might look a bit small, but the entire area of this is actually about 400 square kilometers. So these home ranges are quite large, actually. Um, to cover the whole range of the red animal takes like a two-week hike for us. Well, about a week hike if you're just walking nonstop. So it's massive amounts of forest distance um, to cover. Um, so this is one of the ways we study connectivity. Um, to, to go deeper into the science a little bit, another way we can study connectivity, of course, is to look at the actual genes of these individuals. So say I sampled the genes of the red individual and the blue individual, and I found that they were exactly the same, meaning they were siblings. Well, this would be expected because they exist in the same forest. But say if I sample the genes of an individual in a forest that was disconnected from this one. And I found that they were super distinct. They had no familial relationships. They had nothing to do with each other. Compositionally, they have been separated for three or four generations, which comes up to about 50 years. Well, then I can say that whatever it is that is separating these two forests uh, is keeping it functionally separated, meaning that these two populations are not mingling. And I can show you that because I have the actual genetic makeup. Um, this approach is very similar to what some of you may be familiar when you do this saliva test for websites like ancestry.com or 23andMe, where you can send your saliva and they'll tell you, well, you are 60% Chinese, 20% Indian, maybe a bit uh, Caucasian. Um, it's the exact same process, right? So we take a bit of DNA from the animal, sequence the genome, align the genome to another cat's genome, and then look at these genetic similarities across the genome, right? And that's exactly what I'm doing for my PhD. We have, thankfully, a pretty good number of individuals from Sabah, that north part of Borneo where we've been studying for quite a while. 
And I have every intention to, to expand this data set to across Borneo, to Sumatra, and also the mainland to see, you know, how many years ago, really, did the two species become distinct um, based on genomic data? Uh, you can also answer questions like, which is the source population? So where do we find the most amount of genetic, uh, genetic diversity? We can then call this the source population where all the gene, gene pool is kept. And where's the sink populations where genes go to basically die? You know, where the genes go there, individuals go there, and they are no longer moving out. And these, these fragments of uh, forest are now isolated and bottlenecked. And that's where we're going to see high levels of inbreeding, where, gene, where viruses can come in and wipe out entire populations really quickly. Um, it's a really good tool to suggest policy interventions because, well, really easy policy interventions would be things like translocations. If we know a population is becoming super distinct, okay, let's translocate an individual from a source population and put them there just to mix up the gene pool a little bit. These things are tricky. They require lots of planning, but that's one really easy solution. A longer term solution, which I'm really interested in, is re-establishing uh, wildlife corridors. Singapore has done this, so I think you're really familiar with this concept. Uh, you know, Billy is wildlife bridge. Maybe not as pretty as the one in Singapore, but uh, you know, you can do this really simply and really, really ruggedly by talking to palm oil plantations and saying, "Look, give me these ten square kilometers of land. I'll make this bridge so that wildlife can pass through your plantation." Right? And as you know, there's plenty of plantations in Borneo, so there's massive opportunity for this. It also looks well and kindly on the plantations because obviously they have massive PR issues at the moment uh, because they're seen as these massive destroyers of biodiversity in, on Borneo. Uh, and this is a huge opportunity for us as well. Working on cloud leopards is probably the hardest thing in the world. And I'm not exaggerating because I've spoken to many other researchers. Uh, you know, if you want to study lions, for example, all you do is drag, get on a truck. You'll see a lion pride about 50 meters from you. Get out a, a tranquilizing dart, shoot the lion, it'll go to sleep. You can do whatever you want with it then. Uh, but literally to catch one cloud leopard took us about seven months of tracking, setting up live traps in the most remote part of forest, checking those live traps every single day and waiting for the cloud leopard to walk to the trap. Uh, it's a massive endeavor. It takes about seven people to do so. Um, we work with local indigenous Sabahans to do most of our live trapping. Uh, we keep the team as lean as possible, but it's just a huge logistical endeavor. Um, as you can see, you know, all of the cages we build are built in the top of forest. It's normally a 10 to 12 hour hike to get to these places. And the only way to do it is to strap these cages on our backs and walk. Um, no one is spared. You can see my supervisor, Andy, there also carrying traps. I'm right in front of him also carrying traps. Everyone gets stuck in. So it's really fun, but honestly is one of the hardest things to do, which makes the data all the more precious. Um, but I'm happy we're working on something and putting in the effort on something um, before it's like desperate, right? So we're really lucky to have funders uh, who are willing to sort of put their money where our mouth was and say that this was really important and needed to be done. Um, this is some of the preliminary data that I'm talking to you about that we can get from genetic data. Um, I'm just going to, I mean, we don't need to go into this really, but this is what genetic data will look like. You can see that on that box plot on the right where you have these dots, right? The yellow, blue, red dots. Each of those are individuals and it's a 3D diagram. So you can sort of kind of visually see how close uh, genetically these individuals are. So you'll find that all of those from the blue region is actually from Kinabatangan. And unsurprisingly, they all cluster together, right? Sort of telling us that the individuals in Kinabatangan tend to mate among themselves. There might be some inbreeding um, signals there. And I can then look into this and test inbreeding specifically in those regions to, to try sort of confirm that hypothesis. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing in my PhD. Genetics as a tool is quite new. It is exciting. I'm a molecular uh, And so, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think someone's unmuted themselves, but it's perfect timing because I'm just about done. Uh, and I think there's going to be a Q&A at the end of this session. So feel free to ask me questions then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christian. Um, Vilma, would you like to introduce um, Cedric? And we'll, we'll hold all the questions for after 
Cedric's presentation. Thanks so much, Christian, uh, for that. And when you spoke about connectivity, um, well, yeah, it's something that we in Singapore um, are beginning to realize, uh, you know, the, the great importance and, uh, because we do have uh, fragmented forests. Um, and um, thankfully, our government is very uh, committed uh, to, to trying to link fragments. Um, so we really hope that this works. And um, in our partnership with MyCat in Pahang, we learned all about connectivity because um, there we were patrolling the area where there, there is this viaduct under which we, had, we hope the wildlife will be crossing. So um, yeah, so we, we wish you all the best with your, your studies. And uh, yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. Yeah, we'll have the Q&A later. Um, next up, we have uh, Cedric. Uh, Cedric is a Singapore boy, but he's living in Malaysia. Um, and I think our team feels that it's so great that we have a Singaporean and a Malaysian talking about clouded leopards um today and uh because clouded leopards also share forests with uh with the malayan tiger which is one of our passions um to tell you a little bit more about cedric cedric is currently an assistant professor at the university of nottingham in malaysia uh, the faculty of science and he he graduated from the university of oxford so we have two oxford people here today as well um, however, he graduated from uh, a different department. Uh, he, he, he studied at the Edward Gray Institute of Ornithology. He was studying jungle, fowl, and fruit flies. Uh, he also studied the clouded leopard in Peninsula, Malaysia. And this is the mainland clouded leopard, slightly different from the one that Christian studied and is studying, which is the Sunda clouded leopard. Um, Cedric has a passion for uh, the arts and education, and so he is focusing on innovative education uh, to help people understand about conservation and, and to help change uh, behavior and attitudes. So uh, over to you, Cedric. I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Welcome, everyone. Lovely to see you. And today, my talk will be focused on what I use from clouded leopards, creating games, and then seeing how they work with the audience. My work here is done primarily with the University of Oxford, Wild Proof, as well as the University of Nottingham, for which I am at at this moment and part of part of my work also focuses on elephants in Malaysia. So let's get on with our little, oh, let me just change my, yes, that's right. Okay, I have a little teaser for all of you. We have three questions in our seminar today. I would like you to make a note of your answer to three questions, and we will send in those answers at the end of the presentation. I'll give you the instructions to them. So don't type in your answers to the chat window. Okay, we have a little surprise for those people who are able to get those answers accurate. So, do make note of your answers to three big questions in this presentation and send in your answers for me at the end of the presentation. I'll give you the instructions in a bit. Behind me, on the background, what you'll see is a camera trap photo of the Peninsula Clouded Leopard. Indeed, this is one of my photos that I was proud to obtain over at my study site, Ulumuda in Malaysia. As you can see, it's slightly slimmer, and yet it still has the cloud-like patterns that you see on the Sunda cloud leopard. When I started off with the wildlife research, uh, wild, sorry, wildlife with conservation research unit, wild crew, I studied the cloud leopard using what? Using the camera trap that you see on the right here, this device enables us to take photos of mammals or warm-blooded animals in the, in the forest. When those animals walk past, there's a trigger and the camera will take a photo of the animal. Here, 
we collated data from multiple organizations such as WWF, MyCat, Earthlaws, Bahilitan, which is the wildlife department in Peninsular Malaysia, as well as MIM, the management and ecology of Malaysian elephants. So we collated camera track data from multiple organizations, and these are the sites for which they work at. Their focus, however, were the tigers and the elephants, and so they had bycatch data of the clouded leopards as well. Together, we obtained about 900 camera trap data, and this enabled us to understand where we would find the cloud leopard and what type of forest or home features will be favorable by the species. So, for example, is it very far away from waters? Is it on higher elevation? I'm sure some of you have certain preferences for your very own home. With such a data, we map out the predicted home preferences of the clouded leopard in Peninsular Malaysia. So on this map, you can see that those spots highlighted in blue will be forest areas and the darker blue will be the ones that are more favorable for the clouded leopard and the lighter blue is less favorable. The red line shows the red at the central forest find a master plan to protect the remaining forests in Peninsular Malaysia. And what we found was that within the central forest find there will be 11% higher probability of obtaining the clouded leopard than any forest patches outside the forest find. So it does support the idea that the central forest find is a good protective coverage for this animal. This is the site for which I worked at. These are where I've obtained my own clouded leopard pictures. It's called Ulu Muda. Ulu meaning isolated. Muda meaning virgin or untouched. Okay. And so this is the site that's very near Thai, the Thai border. And we had 80 camera trap stations over there. While working in the forest, unfortunately, this is a common site that we see large-scale deforestation, mostly for the furniture that we have in our homes, but also for paper that we use. And so large-scale deforestation occurred, and it's uh, one that really is heartbreaking. I recall to walk in the forest and going to my camera traps happily, and unfortunately, when we reach the site, you can see over here everything is deforested and previously it was pristine forest. What happened was that it is a legal thing that the government does to generate revenue for the country. And so they cut down the forest, but they left one tree behind, just one tree. And you know what tree that was? That was this tree that was having my camera trap. So they were considerate enough to know that research is ongoing. And so they left my camera track over there with that tree on top. In addition to the threats that the logging poses, we had poachers coming in to the forest. And you can see here camera track photos on the right of people with rifles. They go into the forest, they shoot the animals for their fur. Okay, and I would like to bring attention to the story on the spotted leopard that you see there. This is again a picture of what I obtained at Onumunda. So the spotted leopard is rare because it's a form that is seldom found in Malaysia. What we have for leopards is usually the melanistic, the completely black form. And this is where, so when we saw this, we published a paper, okay, but ever since it, we published that paper, unfortunately, we did not detect the spotted leopard again after the publication. So it's a really unfortunate incident. Um, it may be because of us, but I doubt so because we did not reveal the location of this spotted leopard. This made by what you by, by what I saw as logging and poaching, I decided instead.
instead of just publishing the paper and preaching to the people who already know it's an issue, why not we do something about it? And that's where I created this video that will reach out to the public about the importance of Ulumoda. I'm the neighbour that you never noticed. I'm the friend that helped and provided for you. Ulumuda, that's my name. I'm the forest that gives life. But why have I been assaulted, stripped? Why have my companions, my wild family, had to flee at the sound of gunshot? Logging, construction, poaching. These intruders have forgotten that our fates are entwined. My fate today will be yours tomorrow. I'm the neighbour that you never noticed. I'm the friend that helped in silence. Now, my friend, I need your help to stop these brutal actions that threaten my life. If you wish to re-watch the video, Daphne has posted a link to the video on the chat and it's a freely available video that you will find on YouTube. I'm the neighbor. So this video was created to reach out to the public about the importance of Ulumuda that was undergoing logging and poaching threads. And we top up this video with a petition that will ask the government to protect the greater Ulumuda forest. We obtained about 100,000 of uh, supporters. And as such, after some time, we, we were thrilled with this news posted by the local newspaper. No more logging in Ulumuda. Indeed, the petition to gather the video, together with letters sent in by different organizations, we were able to help ban logging in the order. Our first question for you to think about and note down your answer. How long did it take for change from the release of the video to the news being posted about logging ban? Please don't submit your answer on the chat window. Just make a note. Okay, it can be months, can be years. Okay, make a note on this. And this is our first question. So I'll pause here for a couple of seconds. Okay, think about it. How long does it take for change from the release of the video to logging back? Okay, I hope you have a rough guess of the answer. We'll move on. So this inspired my outreach. And in addition to videos and outreach, I also create games for conservation education. This is a wild crew game that is available in the UK. We have created this game for high school students. And in this game, the players collaboratively work together as conservation biologists or as the diploma tutor or the safety officer to actually save the world's last carnivores. And they will move across the world to the Zimbabwean lions, to the Malaysian clouded leopard, the UK water balls, to the Himalayan uh, wolf. Okay, so and then they will work together to answer questions, real research questions, as well as tackle stories that come from the field. And together they learn, but also have fun at the same time. 
So on the side, indeed, games are an interesting way of communicating the research we do. In addition to board games, I also create my own courses that are highly gamified, meaning they will have a story, they have themes, they have uh, houses for which they work together against other players. You can see here, these are posters of my previous courses, a murder mystery in 2016 on the top left, superheroes in 2017 where they gain special abilities and battle against one another, and we have Harry Potter in 2018 where they gain spells and fight against people of other houses, and finally Game of Thrones where they are in a military training camp and work together to defeat the common enemy. All these courses, we have serious games in the lessons. For example, the casino genetics one, where students bet on their answers and manage their own population of casino chips. The colors representing different traits in a disaster. And if they have only one color and the disease wipes out that color, then unfortunately, their population becomes extinct. So the idea here is to have as many colors possible and as many chips as possible. We have games such as the one on the bottom left, which is about camera trapping, and they have to use their intellectual knowledge about how to deploy their camera trap to get the best reliable data on clouded levels. On the left here, we have forage management, for which the players take on roles of the government the conservation biologists, the urban population, and work together or against one another to build their own homeland or destroy the forest, whichever they choose. We conduct research on the effects of such games, and we found that indeed, the ones with serious games, the games that you saw earlier, have higher enjoyment level than lessons with no games. What are supplemental games? Games that are not related to the topic that are being taught. For example, if you answer a question, you get a point that's just a supplemental game. There's no relation to the topic that is being learned. And we also show that games increase motivation to learn more after the lesson, as well as increase their application of the knowledge to the subject. Games also help in bonding students, and we can see here that lessons with serious games have higher increased bondedness. Okay, they rate each other how they feel about their team members, okay, as compared to lessons where there are no games. Recently, we quantified long-term effects of those courses, and we showed that there have been much positive changes in the participants. We asked them in their current workplace whether they are more likely to initiate changes, provide ideas, are more open to new ideas, leading a group, communicating with colleagues. And apparently, it looks as though they are much better after the course at leadership, at communication, at conducting research. So this is a good outcome of the course. Just, uh, just in, hot, hot off the shelf, we will be having our new leadership in wildlife conservation digital course at Nottingham, Malaysia. Okay, this is open to participants from Southeast Asian countries, and it will start in July, completely online with online games. Yes, indeed, all our games will be transformed to Minecraft, to Tabletop Simulator, to Roblox, and all these are games that you will play online, and no matter where, which country you are at. Another of my gamified activity is an interactive play experience. And in this play, we showcase the life of a cloud leopard and the surrounding actors that influence its life. In this Choose Your Own Adventure theater, we had the cloud leopard as the focus character. And 
the audience are tasked to make decisions for the actors in this play. So you can see here, they base out A or B, okay, to make decisions for the actors. So how does it work? In a typical choose your own adventure style theater, you have a start and you make decisions such as, would you continue or stop wood harvesting, as in logging? If you stop wood harvesting, then the local loses their job. And how would the local decide to make money? Do they stay in the forest or leave the forest and move to the city? If you continue harvesting, however, the trees get smaller and you can either continue to harvest or convert your forest to oil palm that will generate revenue for the country. So there are multiple endings. I won't go through each of them, but here we have five endings. One that will elicit or support illegal wildlife trade, one in which the local was arrested, one in which urbanization will create rich people but sad animals, ecotourism, poor people, happy animals, because ecotourism is not that sustainable in the economical sense, or you can convert to oil palm and fuel the burning forest, which is happening quite a bit in Indonesia. Importantly, okay, we wanted to understand if the audience were experiencing a different ending, would they change their decisions for subsequent behavior? So here we have a group of ending for which is non-oil palm related and a group of ending where we spoke about the issue on oil palm. And we asked the audience later to vote on this issue. How likely would you continue using products containing oil palm? And people may vote as very unlikely to very likely. Now, here we have the second question. How many voters did we get? This we did it at multiple science fairs. Make a guess as to how many voters. Again, please do not put this in the chat window. Just make a note about how many voters we got, what we got. Okay, the picture doesn't show the number of voters. Huh? The picture just shows a subset. So I hope you're not uh, derailed by the number of cubes in the box. Just make a guess as to how many voters we got. Okay, great. Our second question is already revealed. And we look at how okay, the theater ending or theater path correlates with intention in using oil palm products. And here we plot the likeliness of using oil palm products for adults and kids. And for adults, if they are exposed to the oil palm ending, we show that there is a decreased likelihood of using oil palm products in the future. As opposed to kids, there was no difference. Okay, we're not sure why for kids there is no difference, but for adults, the ending did affect their choices. So now we have moved towards a digital format. And if you are interested in a choose your own adventure animation, feel free to scan. You it will bring you to a participant information or informed consent form, and you go to a Lecture, uh, sorry, a digital version of the elephant animation here this time. And I hope you enjoyed it. At the end, I urge you to help us with our research by doing the survey at the end to see if this infographic is able to change our perception and behavior. So do take a scan or a screenshot later, you can play this game. Another one of my project, the digital escape room, is one where we put students or participants in a room and they have to solve puzzles to, in order to get out. This project is funded by the National Geographic as well as the British Ecological Society. And in 2020, we created the face-to-face -face version. And after that, because COVID and the pandemic, we went into a lockdown, we now have a digital version.
I've just revealed my third question. How long on average did it take for participants to escape the room? Interesting question. Okay, just think about how long our attention span is, how long should we keep participants in before they get bored and make a guess in minutes. How long on average did it take for participants to escape our physical escape room? This is our third question and our final one. So now we do have the digital escape room. Okay, this is a, a teaser video for you. Okay, so I pause here. I wanted to say that the QR code does not work because we have finished the hosting of this game. Right now it's under, it's under embargo by National Geographic and will be released to the public only in June. This escape room features the research work that we do in, on cloud efforts. So keep an eye out for it when it's released in June. Great, so another one of my exciting project is a virtual field trip in Minecraft and hopefully this will be released sometime this year in August. In this virtual field trip, you will embark on a journey to discover the cloud leopard in Minecraft and feel what is it like to conduct research on cloud leopards. With that, I'd like to end off with reminding you what the three questions are. How long did it take for change from the video release to banning to logging ban news? Okay, how many voters did we get for the play? And finally, how long on average did it take for participants to escape the room? In order to submit your answers, okay, the most accurate answer gets a surprise from us. So type in your three answers and email in a single message, private chat to Daphne Hong. Don't reveal your answers to everyone, okay? So you can click on everyone there, okay? Uh, or in the chat window, and instead of selecting everyone, you can search for Daphne Wong and type in your answers and email address because we need to contact you if you get the answers correct and we have a little surprise for you, okay? So I'll pause here for a bit. And keep in your answers. Make sure you select a private chat to Daphne and make sure it's a single message, not one message after another. To add the person is Daphne Ong, D-A-P-H-N-E-O-N-G. Please send in your answers. Thank you. Okay, so definitely just wondered how many people have submitted and maybe just wondered whether I should reveal the answers now or maybe later after the Q&A. Um, maybe just give them another couple of minutes. They're still coming yep. in at the moment. Or we can do uh, the answers after the Q&A. What do you think? Yeah, sure. Sounds, sounds good. Maybe we can do Q&A first. Okay, great. So just wanted to acknowledge these people who have helped me and the funders for my projects. And thank you very much. That's my email in case you would like to talk about some collaboration or answer uh, questions for me. Okay. And yes, on to our host. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks very much, Cedric, and thanks for introducing all those very interesting games to us. Uh, yeah, we, we, we will certainly look them up. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, some of you are attempting to answer 
uh, the quiz. Uh, as uh, Cedric says, we have some, we have a surprise for the winners, uh, a nice surprise. So <laughs> please also give your um, email. Well, we've come to the question and answer section here. Um, and uh, we're going to start uh, asking the questions on your behalf and asking our speakers, uh, Christian and Cedric, uh, you know, to answer the questions. Um, Carmen, would you like to start first or shall I? Uh, I, can, I can start, you know, I think um, this one might be for uh, Christian because it's asking about um, the uh, for there's a question about you know what is the common prey species of the clouded leopard and are these prey species also being threatened by the I guess the threats that you mentioned such as deforestation. Yep. So diet wise, the cloud leopard is quite a generalist um, because it's the apex. I mean, slightly different Borneo and mainland. Um, and this is really down to behavioral ecology because on the mainland, of course, it's competing with tigers and the spotted lep the, the common leopard. Um, so it can't eat anything it likes. But on Borneo, there is no competition for a cloud leopard. So it can literally take anything that it can reasonably eat without being harmed. Uh, so we've seen quite often, um, quite commonly, cloud leopards take all of the langurs and the macaques. So monkeys on trees get hunted. All of the manjacks, there are, I think the sambadia is probably a bit too large. It goes out of the range of what a cow leopard could eat. But there's a yellow manjack, the red manjack, mouse deer, all of those fall well within the range. We've seen pictures of them chasing um, pangolins and um, porcupines. So yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, it's quite a generalist species. I don't think there's a specificity. I think it all comes down to how risky an animal is. Uh, you know, a bearded pig is a good example. Small bearded pigs, fine, you know, delicious and juicy, but large male bearded pigs can be quite dangerous to cloud leopards. And I think uh, smaller cloud leopards might not take a risk on that. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. They're so they're not picky. Uh, so, um, Cedric, do you have uh, any uh, insight to add to that, you know, based on your research? So my research uh, doesn't look at the diet of the cloud leopard per se because our camera traps do not show what it is eating. Um, in, to study diet, we often have to look at the hair samples in the feces of the animal. So for my research, it wasn't focused on that. But past papers have shown that they feed on small mammals to feed and some evidence of birds. Cowder leopards in Peninsula Malaysia are largely arboreal, so they actually can feed on birds uh, up in the trees and small mammals such as mouse deer, as well as evidence of the uh, babi hutan, which is the wild boar. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vilma, could you ask the next question, please? Yes, this, this question is for both uh, Cedric and Christian. Um, as an undergraduate student from Canada who is interested in pursuing clouded leopard research, uh, wonder if uh, either of you could take on international volunteers to assist with data organization or sorting camera trap photos. Uh, yeah, I, I've actually messaged Paige when I saw the thing and I sent Paige my email. Because, yeah, there's, there's millions of camera trap images and tagging those images is always the, the, one of the key problems that we face. So, yes, I'm sure we can uh, find something for Paige to do. <laughs> That's great. So, so uh, thanks, thanks for that, Christian. Uh, Cedric, what about yourself? So, my research currently have, has shifted towards education and we do, I, I work with the meme the elephant group over at the University of Nottingham. And so we do not have the internship that's focused on something of camera trap photos. However, if you're interested, there may be online internship that we can do from remotely. Um, 
I can think of some things, for example, hosting of games, online games, or evaluating some of the surveys, post games. So Paige, if you're interested, get in touch as well on these type of educational projects. Thanks, uh, Cedric. Um, Carmen? Yeah, um, I have another question that probably uh, it's for both of you. So someone asked if there is any research, uh, cross research that's being done on um, the Sunda clouded leopard and the mainland clouded leopard. I guess, you know, the, I guess um, the, the, the person is interested to know if um, in terms of comparison or, or, or because there are two separate, I guess, subspecies. So, you know, research comparing them. I, I, I think that's what the quest, the person is asking. And if you're still here, you know, the questioner, I, I cannot, I don't recall who it is, but if I'm not, if this is not what you mean, please um, go ahead and turn on your microphone and um, clarify your question for our speakers. And let's see. I guess. I, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, please. Oh, yeah, Um. so in terms of comparison, not uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's not one paper that compares both of them, but there are papers that will look at what type of habitat preferences each species will take. So these are recent papers published by Walku on large scale data sets even larger than just the entire peninsula Malaysia. So we had clouded leopard data from China, from Vietnam, from Myanmar, etc. Okay, and we look at what type of habitat is favorable for the peninsula Malaysia uh, species as well as the Sunda clouded leopard species separately. These are separate uh, papers. Christian, do you have anything to add on this? Um, comparatively, I think because they are they are really two different species, uh, so there's not a lot that we can compare between the two. But you know, I I, I go back to the uh, genetics papers that were comparing the genetic differences between the two, try and make a case for the separation of species. That was, I think, in my mind, the last comparative paper that was published uh, in two thousand and eleven. Otherwise, I, I I can't think of any one study that was trying to study both because they are really two very different animals at this point. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, next question, Vilma? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. They are kind of linked. Um, someone's asking, uh, and this is probably for, for Cedric on games, using the games, um, what are some copyright issues that you know uh, you would anticipate? Like people here, can we use those games? And uh, are you another question? Another person um, asked the question: um, Are you giving away gaming your gaming engine to others for other animals? So it's like copyright issues, and and what can you use, and what can't you use? Okay, uh, good questions. Most of the games are freely available. The digital escape room is under embargo by National Geographic, but will be publicly released. So there's no copyright. The idea here is to share for education. So, and then the meme, the elephant one, if you play, you contribute to research. So in return, you get an insight into how these games would change behavior and perception but at the same time, it's, it's made freely available for people to use. So have a go, um, there's no copyright issues, I guess it's just a matter of acknowledgement. Um, the games are very suitable for students in high school, as well as even pre-U or university level, or even adults. So it would be fun. We, I'm not sure about gaming engine, um, I think what you meant by it, so one of my games is currently on Roblox and it's the one on forest, forest management. Uh, it just has been completed and I have not advertised it yet. We're, we're still having to go through the testing stage. 
might say the testing stage is about research at this moment before we release it to the public. Yeah, I hope that addresses your question. Yes, thank you. It's actually, the, the, the games sound very interesting. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to give them a try. So uh, we have, uh, and I'm going to combine several questions again, and this um, probably for both of you. Uh, so when we ask people to register for this event, somebody actually sent along a question. And the question is, where do um, clouded leopards like to sleep? And then, so I'm going to combine this question with another one. Uh, someone asked, do they prefer to move from tree to tree or via the ground? I guess, you know, so that are they arboreal or do they prefer to be stay closer to the ground? And then uh, yet another one is, do females, uh, clouded leopard leave them? Mothers at two? I guess, you know, uh, the youngsters, do, do, do mothers leave their uh, cups or do they kick them out at two, at, at, at two? And then after they leave the mothers, do they live in um, solitude? You know, what is, uh, I guess, uh, the society structure for clouded leopards? So maybe both of you can, can answer that. Um, maybe I'll just take a stab at it first and then Sandrik, you can garnish it. Sure. Okay. Um, so the... Social structure essentially is females also leave eventually uh, their mothers, but at a later age. Um, now, again, all of this is really speculation because, again, I'm serious when I say there's a massive vacuum in, in information. Um, it's honestly best uh, from just camera traps and things like that. Um, I, th I think female, young female cubs may stay up to like three or four years with their mums. Uh, as sub-adults and then they would eventually move out. The males tend to leave a bit earlier. On the question about arboreality, uh, again, previous efforts to put camera traps on trees were not successful, uh, at least in Borneo. We didn't get any cloud leopard, not a single one. So the only effective ways of detecting cloud leopards today is camera traps on the ground. So, so that would tend to imply that they are more ground dwelling, but I can't say that either because we're just not looking, we don't have an effective way of looking up in the trees uh, other than walking in the forest and looking up, which is a really ineffective way of looking up in the trees. Um, and so maybe in the future, you know, when thermal cameras develop and they can penetrate the canopy, we can really scan the forest and see how many cloud leopards are truly living on trees. But Dimension, dimensionality is a problem when you start thinking about the canopy because now it's a 3D space, it's no longer 2D. When you're on the ground, it's just a 2D flat space. But when you're on the tree, there's also the Z plane uh, to consider as well, X, Y, and Z. Um, and so it gets a bit more complicated. So I, I really think the thermal camera thing is going to be a, a breakthrough that will sort of answer that question. So to answer the question, we don't really know. They're definitely arboreal because there are plenty of photos of cloud leopards on trees. They may be resting there. They may be sleeping there. Whether they move through the trees, no idea. We, our, all of our camera trap in, images, and I'm sure the same for Cedric, is camera traps, camera traps at the bottom on the ground and we see them walking. So they are definitely walking on main trails where you'll see tigers as well. Um, yeah, I hope that answers. Yeah, that probably answers the question. Yeah, I agree as well. Just to add to that, I think for understanding where they sleep and why we think that they are largely arboreal, it's mainly from zoos when they are kept in captivity. We, there are studies that show that they will be on the trees most of their time and they do sleep up there. Thank you both. So it sounds like, you know, this is a, a great area of study for any budding um, scientists out there, you know, so anyone listening, please, you know, this, we need, we need more people studying the clouded leopard. <laughs> so I'm mindful of the time and it's uh, 530 already, you know, and so um, we have a lot of questions, but I think, you know, in, uh, 
in, in, in view, you know, I don't want to keep everybody here for too long. So maybe Vilma, shall we go ahead and ask the final question? Yeah. Okay. Our final question is this. Uh, it's for both uh, Christian and Cedric. So if you had a wish and your wish would be granted, uh, and you can, you know, your wish will be granted tomorrow when you wake up. Uh, what would your wish be for the clouded leopard in, uh, for Christian, the clouded leopard in Borneo, and Cedric, the clouded leopard in Peninsula Malaysia? Well, after months and months of looking for them, my wish is for, for them to become something like the, I think the best thing for conservation is if the cloud leopard becomes like the cheetah, lion, um, cheetah and lions in Africa, where citizens are able to see them, emotionally connect with them because they can see them, understand how charismatic and beautiful these animals are and how important they are ecologically, but remain at a safe distance such that you, do not inter, you, know, you don't interfere with the animal. I think that would be the most powerful thing for conservation because the problem in Malaysia and the Southeast Asian system is animals are in one corner, we don't interact and we live in another corner and the two worlds almost never overlap. Uh, and that makes conservation really, really tough because we don't know what we're losing. So that would be my wish. If Clara Leopard suddenly felt like, oh, maybe we'll go and live nearby human beings and allow ourselves to be seen a bit more. Uh, yeah, it's a naive wish, but I, I, I dream about it all the time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christian. Cedric? So I think uh, Singapore's the zoo, the new rainforest safari is going to have clouded leopards, if I'm not wrong. It's rumored to going to bring in clouded leopards. I think my wish would be for clouded leopards to live in harmony with other large carnivores. Why I say this is because clouded leopards are the third largest large carnivore, the first largest being the tiger, then followed by the leopards and then the clouded leopards. And we wouldn't want okay, to for the tigers to become extinct as in what had happened in, in Singapore. So it's best to have them around, tigers, leopards, and they are under threat at this moment because they are larger, they're more, um, they're, they're fewer in numbers at this moment. So lots of research work on tigers and leopards. So my wish is for clouded leopards to live in harmony with these two other creatures, magnificent ones, and not have the clouded leopard as the top predator in the Malaysian forest. Thanks a lot, Cedric, and, and we hope both, uh, you know, uh, Christian and Cedric's wishes come true. Um, and uh, just want to alert the audience too that, um, you know, what the two gentlemen have been saying is that, you know, people don't really know about clouded leopards. So we want to really thank both of uh, uh, Christian and Cedric for, you know, enlightening us on this uh, very beautiful wildcat. And in our chat, we put um, a link to a very short video by Laya Liar uh, or Lara Arifin, who's Malaysian. And, and they've done a very lovely short video on the clouded leopard. So do uh, take some time out to, to view that. Um, yeah, over to Carmen. Or, or do we go to Rachel? Rachel, do you have any news for us? Uh, are there enough? I mean, you can't. You don't need to give the answer of the winner. I think right now, but are there enough? Uh... Oh yeah. Hi. Yes. I think the the answers are all in. So I think Cedric, okay. you can go ahead and reveal the answers, and then we will contact. Yeah. Them later. Oh, great. So. We had three very interesting questions and this will be revealed now. You can see the questions on my screen. How long did it take for change from the video release to login ban news? It took almost one and a half years because when the video was released, we needed to gain petition signatures and then we needed to send those as well as letters to the government. And there was quite a bit of uh, lag time. 
how many voters did we get for play? And intellectual dance will think in terms of research and how many people we need to get answers for our research question. And so we got 89 voters from two science fairs, and this was sufficient to understand whether the pathways affected perception and behavior attention. The last one, okay, is three, how long on average did it take for participants to escape the room? Our attention span is approximately 15 minutes nowadays. So we kept our escape room to be solvable by 20 minutes. And on average, people were taking 25 minutes to solve the puzzles in the escape room in order to escape. Okay, well done to those accurate ones. It's 1.5 years, 89 voters, and 25 minutes. We hope we have winners. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, we'll find they out. Thank they you. Early. They weren't yeah. easy at all. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, wow, that's great. Um, you know, no, noting that the average attention span is fifteen minutes nowadays. So you know, we've had, you know, we've captured, you know, our, our audience has has been with us for an hour and a half. So well done. <laughs> so yeah, so I would like to. Uh, once again, thank you both Christian and Cedric for spending time with us today and sharing your knowledge with, um, with us about the Clouded Leopard and about uh, conservation education. And also, of course, I want to thank our audience and uh, please do join us for our other upcoming conservation lectures uh, throughout the year. And before we say goodbye, our tradition is to ask everybody if you would like to participate to turn on your camera and so we can take a uh, Wi-Fi. So let me remove all the spotlights so we can all be on screen. There we go. So, um, Daphne, are you helping us to take the... Yeah, I can do that. Um, I think uh, not everyone saw this screen on. I only had, I only see one page. So, okay. Well, yeah. Again, everybody, if you want to participate, go ahead. Turn on your your camera, and don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Just wait a bit more. I think I see more. Tell us when, when we need to smile, Daphne. Okay, uh, let's just go ahead first. Uh, I'll take the first one. Okay, smile, smile. One, two, three, smile. Uh, one second, let me check that I got it. Yeah, looks, looks good. Perfect. Thank you, okay. Daphne. Okay. Thank you. And once again, you know, really, thank you, Cedric, and thank you, Christian, and thank you, everyone. So we'll see you next time. Bye, have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Cedric. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care. Yep, take care.